It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Amy Longsworth. She's the director of the Boston Green Ribbon Commission. She joined the GRC as director in May 2015 after many years as a corporate sustainability strategy consultant, most recently as managing director of sustainable business solutions practice at PricewaterhouseCoopers. In her GRC role, she works with member organizations and other partners from across Boston's business, philanthropic, and public sectors to help the city implement its climate action plan, which we heard a little bit about from some earlier speakers. Um, she is especially interested in broadening awareness and understanding of climate impacts and solutions through cross-sector collaborations. A strong believer in the power of narrative to make change, which was what Ben was talking about. Amy organized and now leads the GRC's Cultural Institutions Working Group in order to leverage the talents and capacity of the arts and entertainment community in Boston for the climate engagement effort. She also launched the GRCX series of interactive online programs to continue the GRC's convening role during the pandemic. Pre-Boston, Amy has worked as a leader with the Nature Conservancy, a board member of the American Farmland Trust, a freelance writer, and a founding partner at the Veritas Strategy Group, a sustainability consulting firm. She's a graduate of Wesleyan and Harvard Business School, has two children, one of whom is a custom surfboard builder on Nantucket. And after 31 years in Washington, D.C., Amy now lives in Somerville and spends as much time as possible on Cape Cod. So I'm pleased to turn it over uh, to Amy. Great, thank you, Mary. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. Um, Mary asked me to talk a little bit about where Boston stands in its um, climate response, particularly on the resilience uh, on the resilience front, and sort of the story of how we've made progress and the steps that we've taken, the resources that we've needed, and the relationships that have been created and necessary to doing that. Um, so it may be a little bit of a higher level uh, sort of arc, narrative arc than some of the presentations you've heard, but I wanted to sort of, we're 10, 10 to 15 years in now, and I thought it would be helpful to sort of um, tell you the pathway. Next. Next slide, Mary. I'm not seeing the slide advanced. Whoop. Okay, that's fine. We can stop there. So um, the background slide, um, which I was, which just said the words background, um, are, were, I was going to say to summarize, um, if I just had to give you the elevator uh, sentence, I would say we have, we are coming out of the strategy and planning phase and into the implementation phase. And um, even though we thought strategy was really hard, now, in hindsight, it looks easy compared to uh, actually implementing all of the things that we have recognized that we need to do. So um, I think this is a nice segue from Ben's presentation because somebody was talking, uh, was asking to make the point about landfill. And one of the key issues with Boston, of course, is that it is built on landfill. So the white landmass there is the 1630 uh, map of what was above water. And the yellow is um, what was filled in subsequently, mostly at the end of the 19th and into the 20th centuries. Um, as you can see, a lot of our uh, important infrastructure lies in that infill. And the standard then was uh, that it had to be one foot above um, mean high tide, and that was high tide circa 1900. Um, the sea level has risen quite a bit since then. And next slide, looking forward, um, we know that by 2070, we're likely to be looking at um, a coastline that is very similar to what we saw in 16, or not we, but what existed in 1630. Um, I'm sorry, Mary, I'm not seeing the slide advance. Yeah, sorry. I'm having uh, some trouble with the slides, and I'm going to see if this will work no. better. Hold on. Is that what? Do you have it now? Give everyone the chance to memorize the 1630 map. Okay, let me try this again. Sorry, everyone.
Well, now I'm like, hold on. I don't know where it went. Hold on. Ugh. Hold on, everybody. Sorry about this. It would figure that. Um, I can uh, try to pull it up on my screen, or I can just talk on without images, although it's not nearly as exciting. Yeah, if you want to keep talking while I um, pull this. Okay, well, the... Um, I have another way that... The 2070... Um, possibly, but... Shoreline looks yeah, if you want to keep talking, almost you know, identical to the 1630 shoreline is the point I was going to make. Um, if we, there we go. If we look at the... Um, flooding, the flooding proje projections... And, um, you know, Seaport, Faneuil Hall, North Station, and, and Logan Airport end up um, at at least at the 1% annual chance uh, flood tide, flood look, uh, look extremely vulnerable and back underwater. Next slide. So current conditions now, the World Bank has um, called Boston the uh, eighth most vulnerable city to the impacts of climate change. That's that's a little bit of an old statistic, and it's based purely on asset value. We know there are many other values to a city besides purely the physical assets, but that's one easy easy way to measure. Um, and I'm sure even if the, our position has moved a little bit up or a little bit down, we're still in the, in the running for one of the top cities globally. Um, we're still very fossil fuel reliant, which is a problem for our long-term um, carbon free goals. We have high income inequality, which makes it difficult um, to think about how to pay for all of the different low-lying areas that we have when it comes to flooding. We have an old and vulnerable and inefficient building stock. So we have to deal with all these things in the meantime. The sea level is rising. It's extremely, the heat is increasing and the uh, precipitation events are becoming more intense and more frequent and we're vulnerable to flooding. So um, given all that, what, um, what, uh, what was, what is the city going to do? So um, in about 2007 or 8, uh, Mayor, then Mayor Menino and the city hall staff um, began to think about these, these issues. And, um, and, you know, back then, and I know many of you are probably in the climate or at least in the environmental world then, there just wasn't sort of the knowledge of the pathways and the, okay, here's the pieces, what do we do? Here's how we move forward sense that I think um, is becoming established today. So now there are sort of like a series of at a high level action steps for climate planning, then we all sort of know what they are. Oh, but so here, now you're seeing the slides again. So that was, uh, that was flooding um, Sergeant's Wharf and uh, the end of State Street. That was the famous floating dumpster flood of 2018. This was just to prove that, you know, even before all the data was in, even before we had studied it, it was not lost on us that there was going to be a flooding problem next. And similar with heat, you just, you know, those of us who've lived through the last several summers know that, that heat is an issue. And I actually think that because of this summer and because of the coincidence with the pandemic, 
and so many cooling facilities being closed because of the pandemic that heat has leapfrogged flooding as an acute issue on the on everyone's uh, mind and um, causing immediate health issues versus slightly longer range flooding and storm issues. Anyway, um, I was talking about climate action planning. So one more slide, please. Um, and and these are the these are the steps that that you know a city needs to follow. One is to establish you know measure what the what the cause is and understand what the effect is and establish consensus around that. That's a very important thing Boston did with the Climate Ready Boston Plan was not only say you know here's the range of probabilities on a number of these impacts, but let's agree that that's the range and let's not spend a lot more time or any more time quarreling over whether you know, we're, we're plus or minus four inches of accuracy for, um, you know, flooding in 2085. Let's, let's agree on the ranges and know that we're going to be dealing with that range of issues and move forward. Um, assess the risk, uh, prior to, uh, identify your vulnerabilities, prioritize those, and develop strategies for dealing with it. Engage your stakeholders, no one entity, no one um sector is going to tackle this alone establish the capabilities at the government level which is about where boston is right now we are at about number somewhere moving between three and five and so that those plans can get implemented the private sector can do studies they can point to the problem they cannot fix the problem it costs billions of dollars and then monitor and repeat and that's why i found this lovely picture of a spiral because i don't think any of this really ever ends it just becomes an embedded function um, of, of city government so let me uh, move forward now and talk a little bit about the green ribbon commission and the role that it plays so one more great so the mission of the green ribbon commission is to accelerate the implementation of the city's climate, climate action plan by convening, organizing, and enabling leaders from Boston's key sectors. And if you go one more slide, please. We're organized um, around a council of 36 CEOs and then under that organized into a series of um, sector based working groups and that those sector the CEOs are very important for the visibility for the commitment. Um, for sort of speaking truth to power when we talk to the city and talk to the mayor, but the, a lot of the actual you know work gets done at the level of the working groups where these organizations these business enterprises commit their staff to working on a lot of uh, on a lot of the problems and solving a lot of the problems that Boston has. So our our role is to bring private sector resources, money, um, wherewithal, knowledge, technical expertise, pressure, um, but in partnership with the city. So I say all that. Sometimes it's a push. Sometimes it's a pull. Um, but we're always working to help the city implement its climate action plan. Um, we've got uh, our members, it was originally designed as the biggest impact, sort of highest impact, highest profile, highest asset organizations that have an ability to lead, are leaning into change, are willing to make changes, um, and have a, an inability to relocate. So if you think about institutions that are co-branded with Boston, those are the organizations that sit on the Green Ribbon Commission. So um, in the healthcare area, it's Mass General Brigham, it's Boston Medical Center. In higher education, it's Boston University, Harvard, Northeastern, UMass, et cetera. In commercial real estate, we're ter uh, you know, Turner Construction and Boston Properties and Equity Residential. And in the cultural institutions, um, which I broke out a little bit into its two component task forces, because I want to get back to them later. We're talking, you know, Huntington Theater, the ICA, the MFA, the Aquarium, the Gardner. So these are institutions that are in a position to lead. Um, and uh, we have um, the, the 
It was established by Mayor Menino, survived the transition to Mayor Walsh, who's been a good partner, who's the co-chair, along with Amos Hostetter. Um, and our, we have two staff people. I'm just giving you all the details in case you want to replicate our model um, adapted for uh, your own town, your own city. We have two staff people and do a lot with consultants and a lot with willing partners. Um, our budget runs about a million dollars a year. We raise extra money for projects. Um, we have a series of groups that run under the, uh, the different um, working groups to support them. So for example, Healthcare Without Harm is the support organization for the healthcare working group. And, um, and uh, our, we, uh, we are an affiliate of a, of a nonprofit. So we have a 501c3 status in effect and um, are supported by members, have been very generously supported by the Bar Foundation and other foundations. So that's, that's our story. As far as we can tell, and I say we, I mean my, my colleague, John Cleveland, who's the executive director, and I can tell we're a unique organization. Many cities have private sector organizations that serve in this same relationship to the city, um, but we don't know any of them that are purely 100% focused on addressing climate change. Next. So one of the, what we've really done for the city over the past 10 years is um, helped them to get organized. There was no climate, you know, um, department and there still isn't. It's fallen to a large extent under the work of the environment, energy and open space department to figure all of this out. But there was no muscle memory, just like before IT came along, there was no muscle memory there. But now every uh, business enterprise and every government certainly has an IT department. That's what's gonna need to happen with climate change. The two main strands of organization have been around mitigation. So that's sort of the top row. Um, I'm sorry, that's the bottom row. So helping figure out how Boston is going to meet its carbon neutral by 2050 goal. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about that, but that's sort of one strand of work. The other big major strand of work, of course, is climate ready Boston, how we can prosper in the face of long-term climate impacts. And that resulted in the 2016 uh, Climate Ready Boston report, which is that blue cover you see on the right. And I want to go in a little bit to how that came about, where we are on it, and what the repercussions have been so far. Next slide, please. So Climate Ready Boston, you remember when I had my spiral and I said, you know, the first three elements are building consensus, assessing risk and vulnerability and prioritizing vulnerabilities and then developing strategies. Climate Ready Boston really did that um, for, for, for us on the, uh, on the impact side, not the, not, the, not the mitigation and carbon side. But so um, first, the first step was, and go ahead to the next slide. These are the, the elements um, of the Climate Ready Boston project, which was um, fundraised for, the consultants were hired, the project was designed, um, and it was really implemented and run by the Green Ribbon Commission. It was not a city of Boston project. Um, the, they were recommendations made to the city. So uh, the first thing we did was build climate projections. And for that, we turned to the healthcare, the uh, higher ed working group, a consortium of seven different schools organized and led by the University of Massachusetts, Boston, which has a couple of very good climatologists and hydrologists, um, did sort of a meta review of all of the uh, data, decided not to go and seek out new data, but looked at the mass water resource Re, um, the MWRA data and the Woods Hole data and others, and kind of did an assessment 
and agreed on um, the most likely scenarios specifically for Boston. It was very important um, to make sure that we weren't getting um, sort of like East Coast general or New England general data because we are like everywhere else, uh, uniquely situated in a harbor with barrier islands, with the arm of the Cape, um, you know, our hydrogeology is unique and we need to understand it uniquely and we need to be able to understand where the water is going to come and when. Um, there, there was a, a group called, so we worked with Sasaki, we worked with HRNA, we worked with Arcadis, you know, these are, these are big consultants doing a lot of this work in other cities as well at the same time. And they took the climate projections, overlaid onto that a vulnerability assessment, looking at our infrastructure and other critical resources, um, identifying most vulnerable neighborhoods as well and looking at extreme heat, stormwater flooding and coastal and riverine flooding and what were the risks from each of those to all of those different kinds of assets. Um, came up with a set of resilience initiatives. This is at a very high level, I'll show you in a minute, and a very high level implementation roadmap. But this piece of work, which took about two years and again was published at the very end of 2016, um, got us organized, if you will. It, it, it put us on a broad highway um, in, in a direction. And that, that was extremely important. Next slide. So after that, we were no longer uh, just saying, yeah, the sea level is definitely rising. And we know this because there's a stick out in Boston Harbor. Um, but we were actually able to look at flood progression pathways under different scenarios. Next slide we were able to look at uh, monetized uh, annual losses under different flood scenarios. And um, we were able to, next slide, we were able to sort of better understand what the projection was gonna be for heat. And again, this one, it's interesting that in 2016, when this work was first issued, the real focus was on sea level rise. And I'm not, that's not to say it still isn't, but I think, um, you know, hot days, if there were 11 degrees over nine days, over 90 degrees in Boston in 1990, which was the baseline. And by 2030, we're supposed to have between 20 and 40 days over 90. And by 2070, we're supposed to have 25 to 90 days over 90 degrees. And 33 of those are expected to be over 100 degrees. And you're feeling it, like we're, we felt that this summer along with a drought. Um, you begin to think, okay, how do we uh, air condition this largely unair conditioned city, at least on the residential side? And if we do that, what will that do to the demand on the grid? And if we do that, what will that do to our carbon emissions? And also, if we're going to go in and air condition every home, um, then how many times do we want to touch that home? Should we be flood proofing it at the same time and perhaps making it more energy efficient, if not electrifying it entirely? So you begin to see how you pluck at one thread of this sweater and the whole thing quickly uh, becomes unraveled. Um, and, and those are the kinds of questions that began to come out as we worked with this data. Next slide. So this Climate Ready Boston Map Explorer took the flood data and layered it in with other so so social data um, using GIS technology. So now we can see, well, where are the, um, you know, where are the places that are most low lying that are also the most economically disadvantaged where there are also the most elderly or ill people or people who aren't who don't speak English. And that really is helpful to the city in addition to just the pure water ingress kind of mapping to begin to think, well, where do we need to focus um, our resources? And I will just note that the MAPC, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, did a study um, recently and found that heat vulnerability um, and COVID are uh, the, the top five municipalities are the same for both. So we're talking Chelsea, Everett, Lynn, Revere, and Boston. 
Um, and that goes back to all kinds of redlining and other racial disparities that we are beginning to explore. We, I mean, people are beginning to understand more about and wake up to. Um, so moving forward on the slide, please. Um, the five, I referred to uh, five very high kind of strategies and they were called layers of action. And this is sort of a mix of hardware and software. So you have protected shores, resilient infrastructure and adapted buildings, easy to grasp concepts. You know, how do you implement all of that across a city um, of 85,000 buildings? Um, you know, that's why I said it's harder to actually execute than maybe it is to plan, but that's directional, that's good. Um, updated climate projections, that same meta study that I mentioned with the seven universities, we wanna do something like that probably every five years as the conditions change and the data changes um, so that we're always planning for the right thing. And then the prepared and connected communities has to do, next slide, with um, bringing all Bostonians along. So this idea of expand education and engagement, I think is a soft but incredibly important tool uh, or strategy that we need to be probably bearing down on harder than we are. And then um, developing local climate resilience plans. So next slide, I'll just talk about the local climate resilience plans first. So the city, which at this point was really um, owning this work, uh, has was able to identify eight or nine particular neighborhoods where they the that were the most vulnerable and were probably going to need to get going on the work there um, first. And so um, they launched a series of more granular planning studies. Next slide, which brought us into phase two of Climate Ready Boston with these granular planning studies. So East Boston and Charlestown have been looked at and South Boston, including the seaport has been looked at. And there are a couple others coming out very soon, I think next month for downtown and Dorchester. And there will be a couple of more of them after that. And this is beginning to look, it's, they're not engineering studies yet, but they're looking at, um, you know, which roads may we need to elevate? Where do we need seawalls? Where do we need to elevate buildings uh, and so on. So we're, so we're getting down to it. Uh, next slide, the Climate Ready Boston also drove a whole different series of kinds of reports, which were, I would say the first poke at some extremely important questions. Um, number one was about a, a harbor barrier. Why don't, you know, and this, this question has been around for decades. Why don't we just build, a great big seawall. Why don't we just build a dike or or sea gates like they have in the Netherlands? Um, UMass took that on. They looked at it. They and it was um, sort of the conclusion was it's not cost effective for now, for a lot of technical reasons. Um, but did not rule out looking at that possibility sometime in the future, a few decades hence. They looked at at a, and this was top brush up um, governance and for a change in climate, who manages all this stuff? Like I said, there's really no government agency, at least at the city or, or at the state that is like in charge with the budget, with, with the staff, with the authority to undertake coordinating all of the chain, all of the infrastructure and, um, and private sector building that needs to be done. How do we finance it? Um, that is a, really big question mark. If you think about, you know, if I heard an estimate this morning for all of the waterfront in Boston, somewhere between two and 4 billion to protect it. Huge number, but probably not that, but really not that big a number if you amortize it over 30 years for a city like Boston compared to the cost of not doing anything. Um, and then there were a couple of other reports as well, including that one on the bottom uh, which is a closer look at the seaport. And then we had a, a GRX, which, which is our sort of our, our webinar series on that this morning that I, and it will be available on the Green Ribbon Commission website, probably tomorrow or the, excuse me, or the day after. And I really encourage you to go look at it if you're interested in understanding on a property by property basis, how are we thinking in the seaport about 
protecting the shoreline continuous, continuously, and what are the different schemes that have been put forward to pay for that work, which needs to be done fairly immediately in the like 25 to 2025 to 2030 timeframe because Fort Point Channel, which goes right through there, protects huge or fails to protect one or the other, uh, huge amounts of South Boston. Uh, next slide. And um, this is just the image of the current climate action plan that the city is following. This came out in 2019. It's their fourth update. It's by far the most kind of um, executive version, if you will, uh, of this. Uh, of this work and it has a number of steps that they're actively working on that will we hope you know bring zoning changes um establish uh new regulations for how build how much buildings are allowed to emit carbon and a number of other a number of other pieces like that next so our next round of challenges is really you know i went over this already but governance financing regulatory, how are these plans that are now these booklets on paper going to be legally codified? Um, and again, who has authority to do that? And then infrastructure. So this stuff, I'll shift gears a little bit here. This, this stuff that I just rattled through at quite a fast pace is really interesting to all of us who are you know, working deeply in the bowels of climate change, but it is not on the mind of the average Bostonian, I would, I dare say, except when we have a flood or a heat wave. Um, and yet we've got 600, 650,000 residents and growing, and they are going to need to be the ones to vote in the right leaders to approve the public dollars that are have to get spent to support their leadership and to put up with a lot of changes in their um, neighborhoods, their homes, and their transportation systems. And so how do we bring them along to be enthusiasts with all of this? So I want to talk briefly now about the um, role of the cultural institutions as I see it. So next slide. And then next slide again. There we go. E.O. Wilson is uh, one of my favorite thinkers, and you probably all know him. He's a sociobiologist, Pulitzer Prize winner, great master of ants, um, and a professor emeritus at Harvard. And uh, he has a quote that says, the real problem of humanity is the following. We have pale paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. And it is terrifyingly dangerous, and it is now approaching a point of crisis overall. So, you know, it's the way I think about this is we have the reports, and we have the we can build a gigantic pair of swinging gates across Boston Harbor if that's what we decide to do. But how do we really get to the hearts and minds of people who are ultimately the ones who can stop all this once they really understand and feel it? Um, so I began to think, how do people get climate change? So next slide. Um, and if you, if you talk to neurobiologists, they will tell you that, uh, emotion and excitement of the emotion is what creates a memory and a memory is what allows you to think differently about a problem and behave differently the next time when you have an opportunity to do so. So I began to think, okay, so how do we get into people's paleolithic emotion level on this topic? Um, and at the time we did not have a cultural institutions working group. The cultural institutions of the city were basically not sitting at the table along with the real estate developers and the higher eds and the, um, and the healthcare people. So, uh, talked to a few people around town the museum of science and some early people on were like yeah this sounds like a good idea we should be at the table um not to mention that several of them are in very precarious positions on the harbor front like the aquarium and the children's museum 
But there are others who uh, are just really interested in this topic and what it means to change. And so long story short, we started to move through how do people get climate change? Next slide. And you can just flip through these, Mary. So art, this is a, an installation at the ICA, the waterfront through history. We tech, keep going. Technology, music, gardens. That's the that's the food one, but that's fine. That's a garden too. It was also a greenway beehive image. Um, but all of these are things that are happening from the um, greenways and the and the museums and the performing arts organizations of the city. So they have the ability to help us understand through different neural pathways and to help us create that vision, which is what Ben was talking about in the last session. Not only that, but if you look at any kind of trust study or you know trust meter, politicians, corporations, you know, many kinds of authority figures these days, the trust is at an all time low. Museums are still trusted um, to a large extent, and they have the unique ability to deliver information and new ideas to people. And in a, in a non-COVID year, 22 million people walk through the doors of Boston's cultural institutions. They're also, for their own sake, they're high asset, high impact, high profile, have the ability to lead and the inability to relocate that we talked about with you know, the other organizations of the Green Ribbon Commission. So go ahead, next slide. We founded the, um, with some trepidation, not knowing what would happen, the Cultural Institutions Working Group. And again, I'm telling you all this because I think all places, Nantucket and everywhere have cultural institutions or trusted institutions. You have to reach out and figure out who they are, who can make a difference um, and bring them into the conversation so that you've dimensionalized it so that it's not only the planning studies that are, that are you know, the focus of attention. Um, so their mission is to drive awareness and action on behalf of the sector, the city and audiences. So we kind of said, well, who would like to join us? And we had some leaders like the Red Sox and the Museum of Science and so forth. And by the way, culture is defined extremely broadly. Um, go ahead to the next slide. And before you knew it, we had um, like, I think we have now 42 different organizations of all kinds, which is very exciting. And they want to figure out how to do climate action plans of their own, but they also want to relate their programming to helping to broaden the understanding of climate change in the city. Next. So we worked with IDEO, the design firm. We have created a website. Our launch of this wonderful website was delayed because of COVID. Um, was supposed to happen in April um, at a Red Sox uh, game on Earth Day, but we're gonna probably do it next year. But the point is, this is a place where people can go to get action ideas, but also to learn about programming and how it relates to climate. And we're not asking any institution to do any new programming. Next slide. We're just saying, whatever you're doing, if it's art, it's somehow human. And let's talk about how that relates to climate, which is climate change is now the human condition. And you would not believe the collaborations that are coming out of this. So we've got the Huntington talking to the Museum of Science to go over and perform in their theater. Um, and uh, we've got the Goethe Institute sending me, you know, please reach out to this dance organization. They're doing a thing on, on sea level rise where they stand out there in the water. So it's very, um, the, the cross fertilization and I think the ability to make some of the science, which can be rather dry for those of us who are not scientists, uh, I was an English major, um, really, really uh, open new doors to, to the to the people. Um, and if you ever have any doubt about the ability of art to change minds, next slide, you can take a look at one of my favorite pieces here. Um, this is actually not about 
climate change, believe it or not, it's about capitalism. <laughs> I think it could work either way. Uh, it's called Follow the Leaders, and it was installed in Berlin in 2011. So imagine walking, you know, walking along Atlantic Avenue on your way to work with your head down and seeing that over to the side on the Greenway. Um, it would cause you to think. So next slide, and this is, I'm gonna wrap up. As I say to the cultural institutions all the time, if I'm trying to recruit new ones, you know, but it applies to everyone, why should you care? Well, your collections and your buildings are at risk. Your communities and your audiences are at risk and your relevance and your leadership can be strengthened. So why not? You have an opportunity to create a better future for everyone. So get involved, learn the stuff, do the science, do the, do the changes to your electrical and mechanical parts of your building, but also use all aspects of, of, of yourself as an institution, use your voice. Uh, and I'm gonna stop there and hope I didn't go on for too long and there's still time for questions. Mary, I think you're on mute. I am. Uh, all right, yes, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, does anybody have any questions? You can put them in the chat. I think everyone got tired and went home. <laughs> no, they're still there. I can see them up there. Well, it's interesting because um, I feel like one of our earlier presenters was talking about, you know, I, my brain perked up a little bit when they said, you know, how do you get all of these different people and all these different organizations together? And I thought, okay, great. You've got someone speaking about that. All right, Jim Lentowski, oh, here we go. There we go. Jim uh, asks, are the city of Boston reports shown available online? Yes. They're all available on the uh, boston.gov website. Okay. Navigate to the, I think they call it environmental department. There's a whole section in there on Climate Ready Boston. Okay. Um, they're also available, some of them, not all, are available on the Green Ribbon Commission website. And then if you're interested in mitigation, which I really did not talk about, the whole Carbon Free Boston initiative, underneath the top level reports, which is there, there's a raft of um, subsidiary reports that go more deeply into the different energy sectors like uh, transportation, the electric grid and um, thermal and so forth. And though buildings, those are available on the BU website. Great. Uh, Sarah asks, how did you bring on the first cultural institution? Um, Dennis Carlberg is the vice president for sustainability at Boston University, and he sat on a committee at the Museum of Science um, as a friend of the Museum of Science, not a board member, just a, a committee, which was their sustainability committee. And he and I had been working together for a while. And he said, why don't you go over there and tell them a little bit about the Green Ribbon Commission and some of the work that has been happening in the higher ed um, field. And I said, well, why don't you do that? And he said, well, it'd be better coming from a third party. So I went over there and, and we chatted. And out of that discussion emerged the idea that the Museum of Science wanted to be doing more. And Gwil York, who was the chair of the Museum of Science. I think she was pretty early days then. Very, very strong. She sits on the GRC and she's very much a mover and shaker on this. She was in part of that meeting. And the idea kind of hatched. Well, let's get some, let's see what other, what other kinds of museums might want to do this was, I guess, the original idea. And then it just expanded to, to culturals. And now we have zoos and aquariums and performing arts and museum, and not only the big museums. I mean, we have the Paul Revere House and the African-American History Museum and 
the Waterworks Museum, which I think is technically not even in Boston, but they seemed so topical, we had to say yes. <laughs> and I would love to get more sports teams. Um, that's sort of my next mountain to climb so that we're not just talking to the Red Sox, but the Bruins and the Celtics and um, TD Garden, bring, bring that whole world in because it just represents so many, so many people, you know? Organizations, when you talk about organizations that are really physically tied to a place, I mean, the Red Sox are definitely one that are inextricably linked to Boston. Exactly. Want them to move. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Uh, let's see, here's another question. What is the expected time frame for actual projects to protect the city? Um, the, I mentioned really quickly that some of the projects in the seaport are um, need to be put in place in the 20, within the 20, 25 to 2030 time frame. Um, there are probably to protect all of the Boston shoreline. So far, I would say about somewhere in the 75 to 100 projects have been identified using the approach that we've been using so far, which is to go from up here to narrowing it down. It's certainly not to say there won't be more. Um, and those have yet been scheduled, but I have seen a very rough rough Gantt chart kind of, I did this on my home computer thing. Um, that's the beginning of some thoughts on that. And it does go out quite far, 2050. Um, so I think, I think that, you know, obviously it, it, you've got to do the projects in the right sequence because, uh, and, and that's back to having the very nuanced and very localized sense of flooding, both riverine and precipitation related and sea level related because water, you know, I'm certainly not a hydrologist, but you know, water will go where it's going to go. And you can't just assume it's all rising at the same time. Um, so, and then, and then overlaying that with the vulnerability of the different neighborhoods. So. Absolutely. Um, and we have uh, I think time for one more question. Let's see. How does the Green Urban Commission engage those in more um, needy neighborhoods identified as most threatened to become involved and to make changes? I would assume that they, the question answer means folks are sort of at an economic disadvantage. How do you encourage those people to become involved? Um, there is a lot of, that, well, we need, a lot more needs to be done is one answer. Um, but I think on a very localized level, so there are organizations like Harbor Keepers in East Boston, um, which is all about, um, climate change education in a very hands-on way. Uh, let's understand what a storm drain is. Let's look, let's do a project with school kids to measure, you know, um, tide heights. Uh, and I know uh, Magdalena who runs that, Magdalena Ayed, who's great, will, did I say river keepers? It's harbor keepers. I wanna make sure I got it right. Um, you know, is showing up at, you know, farmers markets and, whatever festivals and PTA meetings to get this message out and get this work done. Now that's, there's also at the city level, sort of on the other end of the scale, there's a lot of open houses, there's a lot of information there. The work is published in multiple languages, not as many languages as are actually spoken in Boston, but multiple languages making progress on that front. Um, there's the city has its, um, it's uh, communications um, and outreach program Greenovate, and they are also doing what they can. But I, I really do think it needs to become a lot more systematic. It's almost like we need, you know, 
brigades like telephone like when it's on a snow day when you call your neighbor who calls her neighbor who calls her neighbor you know it's like the pta kind of thing we need to be more organized about that for sure um there's a lot of good the, there are a lot of good groups doing a lot of good work that sounds very vague but i think more needs to be done there's one more um quick question did or will Boston have to change building codes to enable home solar installation or other building changes as part of climate adaptation? Uh, Boston does not control the building code. The state of Massachusetts controls the building code for the whole state. And therefore, technically, the answer is no, Boston hasn't done anything like that. Uh, but we want, we are going to we, the GRC, are going to support the city in their interest in seeing that happen so that we so that a stretch energy code is adopted in the state in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Yes, because that will um, enable us to do more with with all of those technologies. Excellent. Well, Amy, I wanted to thank you again for your time and I'm sorry about the technical difficulties that we had in the beginning. No worries. There I got it. through it. Um, we made it almost all day. So, <laughs> uh, so thank you so much. And uh, folks, if you have any questions for Amy or the Green Ribbon Commission, her contact info is here. And I'm sure we'll check in with all the speakers and 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 make sure we can send you out those uh, those links after the conference as well. So great. Welcome. I'm only sorry it was on Zoom. I given you my background of Provincetown, which I had found a map of Provincetown circa 1910, especially for you, Mary. That's right. I know. Uh, <laughs> well, you're in, it looks like you're in a historic house. Mm. <laughs> no, just a regular house. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Amy. I'm going to say goodbye. And then I'm going to say a couple notes to our, um, <laughs> our folks here today. All right. Well, everyone, I wanted to thank you so much for joining us um, for our first day of our conference.